Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people should be aware that this series may contain images, voices or names of deceased persons. Welcome to Susan Carland In Conversation. This interview is a supplement to Episode 9 in the Australian Journey series, Encounters. I'm here today in the gallery of the first Australians in the National Museum of Australia and joining me is Peter Yu, Yarrow man from the Kimberleys. Peter is the retiring member of the board of the National Museum of Australia and also the retiring chair of the Indigenous Reference Group for the museum. Peter, thank you for joining me today. Thanks very much, Susan. Peter, I understand that you were quite pivotal uh, in the developing of the Encounters exhibition, which I imagine was a quite rewarding but also complex role that required you to negotiate many different interests from different parties. Can you tell me a bit about that process? Uh, thanks Susan. Well it was part of my role as chair of the, um, the National Aboriginal uh, Reference Group of the National Museum of Australia and I also worked, did some work uh, contracted to the team uh, in the negotiations and the development of the project. Um, it's perhaps one of the most rewarding jobs that I've had of, of, uh, in the last little while. I think it was a very complex piece of work, um, the matters of negotiation between the National Museum of Australia and the British Museum, um, and then the engagement um, with the broader Aboriginal community. We started off with about 27, I think we ended up with about 30 at the end of the day, of first contact communities from whence the materials originated, and we we're in the British Museum, and, and some of that material was here in, in the National Museum as well. So, uh, it was a, a collaborative effort that took a lot of hard work uh, and a lot of, um, I guess, generosity on both parts of the British Museum and the, the Aboriginal community that we engage with, as well as the National Museum of Australia. Um, I understand that the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander groups that you consulted with weren't aware of the extent of the numbers the British Museum had in terms of items from, from local Australian communities. I know it would be difficult to generalise across 30 communities, but were there any common themes or concerns that they raised about this fact? I think that's correct. Not many people knew to the extent. The British Museum has a, I think it's a collection of about 6,000 pieces from Australia. Um, and uh, some people uh, on their own accord have actually visited the, the museums, not necessarily from the communities we work with, but. So there is a general knowledge and awareness about um, that have come through, I suppose, the, the broader the politic of dealing with the um, remains, uh, skeletal remains issues, the patriational skeletal remains. And so that's uh, probably uh, very much uh, a heightened awareness of that in the Aboriginal community. But in terms of particular objects, which of course is not necessarily dealing with the British Museum when I talk about the skeletal remains, but um, the Natural History Museum of, of, uh, of in, in, in London and amongst many, many private and other institutions around the, around the world, I think you'd be quite surprised, unfortunately, at how many uh, pieces of materials are there. But um, this was not to do with that. This was to do with material objects that were taken um, from Australia under various circumstances. Um, and there's conjecture and debate and discussion about what those circumstances might have been or were. So, um, so people were intrigued and, um, and very interested to find out more, and, um, but very anxious to, to know whether there was material from their particular communities and what they were, and to understand what they were. The, the Encounters exhibition straddles quite a wide range of items and artefacts and displays, right from cultural dispossession to items that um, reflect the strong resilience of Indigenous communities in Australia. Can you tell me if there were two artefacts that personally really impacted on you? Well, well it's hard to go by the, the, the Weagle Shield. I think, I think that, that you know, is described in this kind of business as a, as a champion object in respect. It, it's, it's, it stands out because it was on that day um, in um, 1770 in Botany Bay when Cap Captain Cook, well, sorry, it was Lieutenant James Cook at that stage, wasn't Captain, was he? <laughs> um, and um, uh, uh, when, when there was that first encounter mm. on the beach with the traditional owners, 
and um, you know it has a little uh, piercing hole in the shield if, if uh, people have seen it at the exhibition and there was uh, kind of uh, conjecture as to what was that a musket hole or was that a, uh, a spear hole I think the experts have, have researched and said it was probably a spear hole rather than a musket hole but it was dropped on the beach and was collected by Cook um, to to see that object and to and the emotion attached around it was is quite um, it, it's, it's, it's an incredible experience. I, 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 when I first saw that object in, in London, I, it was very emotive. And, and every other Aboriginal person who I've spoken to who have been to London and seen that had exactly the same response. They were basically brought to tears mm -hmm. by it because of what it represented and, um, and what it didn't represent in terms of what happened on that day and subsequently in the history of this country. Um, it's, a, it's, it's highly symbolic in nature, but the object itself tells you this amazing story. Um, and I think the other one, and I might be a bit biased in this one, but they're the Kimberley kind of spear points, um, mainly because I think that what they demonstrate is the ingenuity in the, in the technology um, in using the kind of raw materials that were used and then the evolution of that um, into uh, ceramics, you know, from the old telegraph uh, pole um, conductors and then into glass, bottled glass and various other objects. I think the, the fact that uh, there is a view about the lack of technology or, or, or creativity or ingenuity in, 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 in our culture and in Aboriginal society, and, that, and, and they're magnificent pieces of work. Uh, to me, they're kind of like, uh, they're art pieces, but they're also you know, we're used for very serious um, matters as well for hunting. So, so I think those two, but it would be unfair because to, 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 to just nominate them because, I mean, the entire collection represents so much more in terms of the, um, its meaning from, which, from the communities from whence they came and the people uh, who are directly associated with those objects. I mean, it, it, it's, we should not underestimate the nature mm -hmm. of, of the, the emotion that evokes um, and how people feel that personally um, and uh, how the community kind of feels about that in terms of its, how it identifies itself, what its connection to that in terms of the circumstances, uh, what, what it means in terms of their future aspirations. Um, I, think, I think objects are grossly underestimated in terms of their, um, you know, psychological and, but also emotional but, um, but social impact on us in, in, in identifying who we are in any particular group and how that belongs to us and reminds us. It's a clear reference point to the whole range of things that, that provide this issue of identity. Peter, you've written a reflective piece that accompanies the exhibition where you talk about um, perhaps moving away from an urgent push for repatriation and perhaps moving towards a more consensual approach amongst communities. Do you see any evidence for approaching this consensual approach amongst Indigenous or non-Indigenous Australian groups? Well, well, I think like any society, there's going to be diversity of views about this um, uh, highly sensitive question. Um, and particularly for First Peoples in a, in a marginalised environment where, as I've indicated, they, the, the attachment um, uh, goes way beyond just a piece of uh, object, material. It, 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 it is uh, fundamental in terms of people's reference points and who they are, where they've come from and where they are today and, and uh, you know, what their aspirations are in the future. And that's the way I see these objects and I think a lot of um, the responses we got from the communities, I think there's similar kind of feelings. So I don't think there's a, a ready-made answer uh, to a very complex uh, and highly charged um, kind of question in respect to repatriation. I do, I do think that um, what I was extremely um, pleased about and happy about is, is the, the engagement methodology of the museum with the 30 communities, where we allowed them to have ownership uh, directly associated with what they thought, what they felt about those objects, and, um, and um, th what their views were, in, in fact, in how, in how we even designed the exhibition. And we took great notice of that. And I think, you know, in this modern contemporary time, the issue of um, pre fire informed consent, you know, which uh, is, is fundamentally the rights, particularly of um, First Peoples around the world, we were asking this question about what should the relationship be between um, First Peoples um, and, and uh, cultural institutions in the 21st century. So um, many uh, people 
I was I was quite pleasing to to hear and to to have the comments that came from the communities concerned. Not everybody agreed, but basically um, their interest is to recognise that museums did have a role historically, that nothing the, the nothing was perfect in terms of the, the manner in which some of those objects were obtained. You know, some were stolen, some were gifted, some were negotiated. I mean, there's a whole range of what the you know what the provenance of of, of, of that um, is a matter of historical kind of legacy and, ju and, and judgment, if you want. But uh, people are a lot more sophisticated today, and, and we have we have we have access to you know immense range of technology that changes the nature of which we're thinking. But it doesn't take away that fundamental concern about recognition, identity ownership so that the consensus approach is about negotiating what's the, the, the best alternatives you know as they say the best alternative to a negotiated agreement um, you know as they teach in Harvard so, so the thing is um, people were wanted to bring some of those materials back home so they could show uh, the younger people the design the technology uh, other people wanted to take the material and to, then to uh, make their own determination about what should happen with it um, uh, other people wanted to negotiate a uh, better protocol at the museum in terms of accessing those materials. Um, so there's a whole range of kind of possibilities, and I think that I, I think that um, the the kind of black and white responses to um, you know hugely complex kind of questions um, uh, deserve a lot more thinking, um, and I think uh, a lot more. I think we're better equipped today to be able to negotiate them. Uh, an example of this was uh, the Nunga community in Albany um, said during the consultation that they wanted the trustees of the British Museum to write to them to thank them for allowing the trustees to be the custodians of the material that they own. You know, there are other examples of where um, people have offered to make replicas of the, of, the, of the object and to replace that but to get the original one back. Um, and this is not just unique to uh, the Australian context. Um, internationally that's happened before. Um, there was an example in Canada where was a, a very um, sacred totem pole that was taken by a foreign government and museum and uh, a lot of the young men wanted to go and you know take it rip it out of the ground and the old people said no we'll, we'll, we'll negotiate so they they built a replica but they consecrated it the same way and they replaced that but they got the original one back. So there's a whole uh, we have to be much more clever and smarter in, mm. and, and I think that uh, people are today. And the older people are sort of taming it, the, the fire of the younger people, it seems to happen with every generation. Yes, and I think, I think that that's, uh, you know, um, it's a fire burning as a result of the ongoing historical grievances. And you don't blame people for that. Yeah. But, and, and you don't try and move away from it. That has to be part of the, of the discussion. That has to be part of the negotiation that... Um, people's discontent, people's historical grievances, their anger, their kind of, their need to be able to have answers um, is part of the conversation. It can't, uh, to, to not do that would be disingenuous and, and, and would in fact, you know, deny a great opportunity to try and arrive at some agreeable position on this. Peter, you've described the Encounters exhibition as an important milestone in the relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians, but the term milestone implies there's a journey. What do you think is the next milestone in the journey, or where are we in this journey? Well, well I think it's a milestone uh, for, the, for the museum in the first instance as a, as a cultural institution and the success that it's had. I think it's a, a milestone in the story of the country in respect of its contribution to the current discussion debate about uh, constitutional reform issues, about recognition of Aboriginal people. There, we've got a wide public debate about um, that deals with issues of sovereignty, about treaty. Um, we've had uh, 40 years of basically failed public policy in respect to dealing with historical grievances of Aboriginal people. Where, uh, we're, the, we're the oldest living contiguous culture on the earth, you know, in, on, on the planet, and, and, and that's not just a slogan, that is a reality. Um, the milestone that should point to what should happen is that the, the exhibition encounters is really a portal for, for all Australians to come through and to kind of orientate or investigate themselves about what those truths are. But 
but not just as a matter of, um, of, of guilt. You know, Mandela said, we don't want you to feel guilty for what's happened, but feel guilty if you only want to perpetuate what's happened, you know. And I think, uh, I think that same kind of uh, thing applies in this country. The Aboriginal people don't want the broader community to feel guilty about what happened, but understand what happened so that we're, we're not repeating those things. And, and so the, the portal is for, um, for ordinary Australians to, to investigate and to embrace this. It's not just an Aboriginal thing. This is an Australian thing. And, it, and um, all Australians should be part of this. And that's what the Encounters exhibition has offered. So if we, if we part of that legacy um, is to build on um, understanding and improving our relationship in, 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 through cultural objects, through kind of, um, you know, Aboriginal art is well recognised uh, in this country already. And um, there's probably um, artworks through every office in Parliament House. Yet you wonder if the politicians really appreciate the stories, the significance um, and the values that are expressed in, in terms of this particular form. Um, I would, you know, wouldn't hesitate to say the question that, that that's in fact something that they do. Um, you know, it'd be very nice for them to come and understand what a uh, cultural institution like the muse museum is doing as contribution uh, to Australian society. These are critically important um, institutions that uh, define us in our evolution towards a greater sense of maturity in this country. And so, uh, you know, I would sincerely hope one of the legacies is that this is, and a lot of people came to the exhibition, I think it was over about 90,000 people over a four month period, which was a bit of a record for the museum. But uh, I would hope that um, they've gone away, and I've spoken to a lot of people who've been here and have said it, how emotional it was for them as Australians. These are, these are non-Aboriginal people. And uh, said it was a fantastic exhibition because they didn't know. They didn't know the stories that these objects told. They didn't know the stories that were coming from the communities from where these objects came and, and how it was um, you know, relating to the, the experiences of those communities and their aspirations of those communities. So, so it's critically important. It can't just be seen as a exhibition in, a, in, the, in the National Museum of Australia. It has to be seen as a, a, a kind of a tool that uh, we can use to better understand ourselves and better understand and prepare us for how we might negotiate. I mean, if we're successful in, in the constitutional recognition, the most important day will be the day afterwards. You know, what will, what will happen then in the relationship being, between the broader society and we as the first peoples of this nation? That's the question. So this is not, this is not set out the realms of those discussions and the questions that are, are asked that remain unanswered. By all evidence, the Encounters exhibition was incredibly successful. Tens of thousands of people came through in, in just a few months. I'm interested to know, what would you change about the exhibition? What do you think could have been improved? What could have been better? Well, I think you could always improve things. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm extremely happy and I think the museum is extremely happy. And, and if you define it as a milestone, I think you've got to be happy, you know, but um, what can we improve is, I think, um, the nature of the the kind of political interest in this in this country to become more engaged and to understand uh, the expressions or the values and the voices that come from this museum, so that they embrace that in some genuine leadership fashion, so that um, uh, cultural institutions become a place in the hearts and minds of of all Australians. Um, not just because it's situated in Canberra and those people make the effort to come here, but we need to uh, explore uh, the genuine contribution that, the, that this institution can make. Um, and it's a pity that more of our, our senior leadership in this country um, don't take the time or the effort to come and, and do this. I mean, we're only probably a couple of kilometres down the road where the big house is, but um, it's... Yet when you, go, when you travel overseas, um, you can see the nature of how the, the, the culture of the community or the people is embedded in everyday life, in the social conversation, in the kind of political manifestations, in support of cultural institutions. We haven't yet reached that point, and that's a challenge for us. And so how do we manifestly um, try and, and display the kind of values and embrace the values uh, as, a, as a community and how do we engender the nature of um, the ownership of those values within a, within a mainstream way? And I think 
uh, you know, their kind of ambitious philosophical kind of, you know, pinings, I suppose. But, but I, I think that's, that's what we have to aim for. So uh, I think what we've got to do is to build on the legacy of this. And one of the, one of the legacy issues is that we've now have a six scholarships for young Aboriginal uh, researchers and people involved in cultural studies who, in, in partnership with the Prince's Charities of Australia, uh, Prince Charles's Charities in Australia, and he was a patron of both the Enduring Civilization exhibition, our sister exhibition in London at the British Museum, and, and the Encounters as well, and he came and he, he seen both of them. And um, he was, um, he's been very supportive of that, and as a result we have a joint venture between the National Museum of Australia and uh, his charities uh, to sponsor six uh, young Aboriginal, maybe not so young Aboriginal people, people involved in, in this area, to study in London um, at his School of Traditional Arts and uh, Oxford at Cambridge British Museum and also here in the National Museum of Australia. So that's a legacy issue. And uh, we would hope that we can, what we've done is to build some capacity in learning and competency in, in museum studies and uh, curatorial you know, uh, responsibilities so that these, the people can, can use that experience back in their own communities. But hopefully it will also in, enhance the kind of the, the communication and the bridge between the museum uh, into the future with, with communities around the country. Thank you so much, Peter. Thanks very much, Susan. And if you're interested to see more of the Encounters exhibition, including responses from some of the community members that Peter referred to, check it out at the National Museum of Australia website.